the, Jesus walked into this restaurant one time, and as he sat down, a man with a limp walked over to him and says, You're Jesus. Do you mind if I buy you lunch? And Jesus says, Well, sure, thank you. That's kind. Then another lady sitting at another table with arthritis in her neck, very stiff neck, got up, and she walked over and said, Jesus, he, he, he bought you food. Do you mind if I buy uh, what you want to drink for the meal? And Jesus said, Well, that's kind. Thank you. In walks a redneck. And the redneck looks and says, why, look a here. You're God's boy, aren't you? I tell you what, someone's already paid for your food. I'll, I'll buy you dessert. Is that okay? And Jesus said, well, sure. Well, after Jesus finished eating the meal, he walks to the man who has the limp and says to the man, because of your kindness, I'm going to heal you of your limp. Suddenly, the man was able to stand. He was able to jump around and dance around, and he was ecstatic. Then he walks over to the woman and says to the woman, because of your kindness, the arthritis in your neck is gone. And suddenly she was able to move her head. And she was ecstatic. He turns and he's walking towards the redneck. And redneck says, now Jesus, you just stay right there. If you heal me of my laziness, my wife's going to make me work around the house. <laughs> Which raises an interesting question. And, and it sounds silly, but do we want to be healed? This is the question. Jesus asked the man who had been lying for 38 years at the pool of Siloam. And he had been there making all kinds of excuses. The question is, do we want to be made healed? Be well. Now, the, uh, back in the spring as I was preparing for the summer's themes, knowing that I was going to have surgery this last Tuesday, and knowing that we usually have a Sunday in the summer, we focus on healing, I thought, well, God, maybe this is where you want the healing service. So this is what we're doing today. And so to, before we go any further, let's do some review. Before we talk about, or about the issue, let's review the is how God heals. In the Bible, there are five ways that God heals. First of all is instantaneous healing. Uh, in John chapter 4, you have the situation where the centurion comes and says, Jesus, my son is dying Please heal him. Just say the word. And all Jesus did was say the word, and the boy was healed. Instantaneous, just like that. You and I know of situations today that they have an instantaneous healing. That's one way in the Bible. Second way in the scripture that you see people are healed is pure common sense. And that is, God creates the condition where healing takes place over a period of time. For instance, if uh, you have back pain, or ulcers, or migraines as a result of stress, if God healed the symptom, that is the migraines, or the ulcers, or the back pain, and not the stress, it's going to come back. And so instead of focusing on the symptom, God focuses on the cause. By healing stress in time, the migraines, the backaches, all that goes away. That's creating the condition where healing takes place over a period of time. The third form of healing in the Bible is medical science. In John chapter 5, you have the man who is um, uh, born blind. And the man who's born blind, uh, Jesus spits on the ground, makes clay of the spittle, and then he takes the clay and puts it in the blind man's, blind man's eye. Now, did Jesus have to do that? I mean, earlier, the chapter before, all he did was just simply say, hey, you're well, and the son was healed. He didn't have to touch that man. He only had to say the word. Why did he put spit of mud in a man's eye? In Mark chapter 8, you have the situation where Jesus heals another man born blind. Again, it says that Jesus took saliva and put it in the blind man's eyes. Why did he put saliva in the blind man's eye? Now, I know it sounds ridiculous to us today. But in Jesus' day, that was the known medical science for healing of diseases, including blindness. And just as the last century, people thought if anything could be healed, penicillin could heal. In Jesus' day, they thought if anything could heal, saliva could heal, because saliva does have healing agents to it. And so Jesus was using medical science. And I believe he was using medical science not because he had to, but because he's saying to us, Medical science is a valid form of healing. In James chapter 5, verse 14, James says, um, if, any of you, if any among you are sick, 
They should call the elders of the church and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. Now the word oil here is kind of a mistranslation. It's not olive oil, it's not cooking oil, it's not WD-40, it's not any of the oils. It's a medicine oil. We don't see that in the English translation, kind of like eucalyptus oil that have healing properties. And what James is saying is, if any of you are sick, yes, go ahead and pray, but also take your medicine. Medical science is a gift from God for healing. And I'm sure glad for medical science, especially anesthetics and pain medicines this last week. Amen? Amen. Fourth form of healing is harder to accept, but it's a valid form of healing. It's the grace sufficient for the need. It comes from 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 12, where Paul says he has prayed three times for the healing of the thorn in his flesh. Now, what was the thorn in his flesh? We don't know. None of the scholars can figure that. We all speculate. But the phrase three times is an idiom, kind of like, wait a second, or fast as lightning. The phrase three times means over and over and over again. Like he says, he's prayed three times for the healing of the thorn in the flesh. He's prayed over and over and over and over and over and over again for the thorn in his flesh to go away, whatever it was. But then the answer came by Jesus in the next verse, verse 9. He says, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Now, what does that mean? Paul still had the thorn in the flesh, like a lot of us still have our ailments. But Christ's grace enabled us to have exactly what we need to continue to carry on. As I've shared with you before, I've got a friend named Tom Benford, who's a pastor, who has the kindest, sweetest personality of anyone I know, except for my wife. The kindest, sweetest personality of anybody I know. As a child growing up, uh, he had bone diseases, which resulted in amputations. One leg is cut off above one knee, the other leg is cut off below the other knee. He walks around on two artificial limbs. And, and one day we were talking, and he said, Skip, God has healed me from the top of my head to the tip of my toes. Now, he and I are at a place in our lives together that I could tease him. I said, yeah, Tom, where are the tips of your toes? And he responded by saying, Skip, don't you remember that the word in the Bible for healing does not mean that something necessarily will grow back. The word for healing in the Bible means to be made whole, to be made complete. It's the same word for salvation. And the cousin word means knitting of the bone from which we get the word peace because you cannot have peace unless there's complete healing. And he said, you know, I may not be able to walk like you. And then he added, thank God. He said, I may not be able to walk like you or run or play or whatever, but I am alive. By the grace of God, I am alive. And God gives me the grace to love and be loved, he, to care and be cared for. I'm married. I can still be a minister of the gospel. God has given me the grace for all I need. Then we talked about people that you and I know here. We talked about people that he and I knew who are in nursing homes, in beds, who are homebound, in wheelchairs. They'll never, ever get up, never walk around like us. And yet, they have a holistic outlook on life that is far healthier than most of us in this room. That's the grace sufficient for the need. Now, the fifth form of healing, on some cases, easy to accept. In other cases, it's very hard to accept. It comes from 1 Corinthians 15. It's called death and resurrection. You see, the warranty does run out. My knee warranty is running out. Every single person that Jesus healed in the Bible eventually died. We all will die. Does that mean God doesn't care and say, oh, okay, you're dead, you're gone? No. It doesn't mean that at all. Paul explains what happens with death. And I try to emphasize this with practically every funeral message I present. He talks about how the, in 1 Corinthians 15, the perishable is replaced by the imperishable. The imperfect is replaced by the perfect. The corruptible is replaced by the incorruptible. Do you catch that? That means, literally, we're given the perfect ten body in the resurrection. Now, all four of my grandparents, uh, when they died, 
I know their situation. I know my dad's situation with his cancer. My uncle, I know Kathy's father's situation with his cancer and, and Kathy's grandparents. And their health, quality of life, just wasn't much. But I know today, in the kingdom of heaven, they are alive, healthier, probably than they ever were in life. Uh, before Kathy and I had our first child, we had a miscarriage. Now that's tough to take. And those of you who've had that, you know what I'm talking about. It is tough. But we know who God creates, God takes care of. And that God has taken care of this child, and we'll see that child someday in the kingdom of heaven. That's death and resurrection. That's a healing that God provides. So those are the five ways God heals. Now we need to understand something else related to healing. Each of us have five personality parts. They're not separate. They're very much integrated. Physical, mental, emotional, relational, and spiritual. And if any of us are sick, let's say with the flu, that's definitely going to affect how we think, how we feel, what we say to people, how we pray. If any of us are having tension with someone in relationships, that's definitely going to affect how we feel physically, what we eat, whether or not we can sleep. It's going to affect how we think, how we relate to people. It's going to affect our prayer. If any of us are under stress emotionally, that's going to affect us physically and how we think and how we relate to people and how we pray. In other words, we're very integral in all five parts, which means, I want to get to this point. When you and I pray for healing in one part, the answer may be in another part. I used to be terrified when I became a pastor to pray for healing for a person. Because what if I prayed and that person died? There's something inadequate about me? Eventually I came to learn that no pastor, no person can replace Jesus. Jesus is the great physician. And that Jesus will provide the healing that is needed. We just simply have to trust. Four, while I may pray for a person's physical healing, Jesus may heal, like I mentioned earlier, some emotional issue, which may be causing the physical problem. I know of couples that I have prayed for, for healing in their relationship, and it turns out there was nothing in between the two of them. It was a physical problem. Hormones were affecting how they felt towards each other. I've been people under stress, and, and they wanted to blame the stress, when in reality, the stress was the result of something else in their life. In other words, when you pray, while we may be focusing in on one area, know that God will provide healing in the area where it's needed. It, God will provide that healing. Now, which brings us to an interesting question. In Matthew, I mean Mark chapter 8, you have the man at Bethsaida who's blind. Something interesting happens here. Jesus heals his blindness. He puts the saliva in his eye, heals the blindness, and then he says, what do you see? The man says, well, I uh, see people, but they look like trees. Do you catch that? Of all the healings in the Bible, Jesus makes complete healings, except this one was not complete. It was only a partial. So Jesus looks at him a second time and gives him a second touch, and then he can see clearly. Why? What happened there? Scholars speculate that what happens with a lot of people is that, yes, God wants to provide the complete healing, but we kind of hold back. And so when I asked the question earlier, do you want to be healed? In reality, a lot of us don't want to be healed. We want to hold on to where we are. And that hurts us. For instance, I know of people who are retired, who uh, have no symptoms of any disease until their daughter or someone in the family is going to go out of town. And all of a sudden, they get sick. You know what I'm talking about? So while on one hand, they are healed of symptoms, there's something they haven't allowed Jesus to heal in their life. I know of couples who have been healed of their relationship. But one of them refuses to let go of what happened years ago, and it just continues to fester. 
And that person needs a healing in that area. I know of people who have used their faith as a band-aid to give the appearance of healing, when in reality they're covering up things that they've never allowed Jesus to heal in their life. Is there an area in your life that we're just, any of us are just simply keeping Jesus out of the way and not allowing to heal? Now I'm going to give you that classic example I gave a while back. It's the perfect example. This nun who was dying, they couldn't figure out why she was dying. She was in the hospital, on the deathbed, she was about to go into a coma. The chaplain, who was a priest, very wise, went to her, sat down beside her at the bed, and said, okay, before you go into a coma and die, do you believe that if you confess your sins, Jesus forgives? She said, yes. Do you have anything that you've never confessed that you want to confess? This is your chance. She said, yes. And she confessed that she had lost her virginity earlier when she was a teenager. She's 56 years old. She was a teenager when she lost her virginity. And the reason she became a nun was because of that. So that she could stay away from men, not do it again, and so that God would love her. It wasn't because of a call by God. She felt guilty all those years. Well, she confessed that. The priest then said, you have been forgiven. Do you believe that? And she said, yes. He then anointed her with head, said, receive the forgiveness and healing of Jesus. Well, he left. 24 hours later, her vital signs were all normal. One day after that, she went home from the hospital and lived almost 40 years into her 90s. Now, practically every one of us have things that we're keeping Jesus at arm's length that we're just not letting Jesus heal. What is it in your life? Jesus wants to give a healing touch. Now, notice what happens in the scripture in, in Mark chapter 8. Jesus heals the blind man. He sees something vaguely. And then the scripture says, he looked at him intently. Notice Jesus doesn't want to give up. He looks at the man. And, How does that look? What does it look like? Well, as I look at the scripture, I see Jesus as radiating nothing but love. The only people he gets angry at are those who say, I, you know, I don't need any help. Those are the only ones he gets angry at. But he looks at the person with love, and he heals. He wants to heal. He wants to heal. Will you close your eyes, please? Everyone, close your eyes. On the back of your eyelid, look at Jesus coming to you. And just look at that loving smile that's on his face. He's not going to force anything on you. He's not going to make any, do anything that you don't want to do. But he looks intently in you and he says, here's an area that you need to let me heal. Will you let me heal it? Will you let me touch it and make it whole? Will you let me forgive you? Will you let me help you make a new start? Will you heal this, Lord? Lord Jesus, I pray for all of us that you help us, let you touch us with your hand. Please, Lord, give us that second touch. Give us that healing that we need. Make us whole, complete. Knit the bones of our lives, of our relationships. Lord Jesus, please provide that healing. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen.